is uh, you bring us behind the scenes on 9-11. Mm -hmm. um, and you're with the president. And is it, speaking of Dick Cheney, Dick Cheney calls the president not once but a number of times. At least twice. At least twice. And is asking the president, Mr. President, if there's another plane that's hijacked, do you give authorization for our military to take that plane out of the air? Right. Tell us that. Bring us behind that, that story. We're sitting in the front cabin of Air Force One, and uh, Andy Card and I were there, and the vice president calls. I can hear one side of the conversation, and the president says yes, uh, calmly but forcefully, and then he says, you have my authorization, and he hangs up. And in a matter-of-fact voice, just I, I remember how, how calm it was on the plane that day. Uh, he said, he explained what he had just done, which is give authorization for the, for the Air Force to shoot down any aircraft that were en route to a target and were not under the control of the, of the crew. And I remember being shocked. And then the president, after a few moments, reflected on how, he, he, how terrible that would be for a young aviator who was given that command. He'd been a young fighter pilot himself. Later, uh, a little while later, Cheney called back to reconfirm it. And the president, again, you know, very calm, very matter of fact, but, it, but you could just tell, and, and I could see him. I've known him a long time. We've known each other for decades, since I was 23 and he was 26 or 27. And there was a, you could tell, you could see in the corners of his eyes and the tightness of his mouth and the, the, you know, how firm his jaw was, that this was a consequential decision that he had had to make. You know, you'd also describe, I had often said as an outsider, that I think the day that, that George Bush became president, really understood that he was the president is when he went to New York. And you describe what happened with this uh, older firefighter. Bob Beckwith. Bob, and he stood on the rubble. Right. And un, uh, not scripted. Right. No teleprompter, this, by the way. Right. No interesting. Yeah. Um, this is the iconic moment of the Bush this presidency. This was it. This yeah. was it. Now, here at Ground Zero, uh, we had come, we had toured the uh, one corner of Ground Zero and then had come around in the northwest corner of Ground Zero where they were removing a lot of the debris. And we came down a short street and then made a right-hand jog. And the motorcade was only like four vehicles that day. And uh, we got out into a sea of noise. There were these huge men, these you know, firefighters and rescue personnel and iron workers and steel workers who were pulling things out of the rubble. And I've never been around so many big people in my life. And they were chanting, USA, USA. And a little uh, White House advance woman named Nina Bishop came up to me and said, got this far away from me, and said, they want to hear their president. It was not on the schedule. And uh, I said, is there a place he can speak from? And she said, in the microphone, she said, no. I said, well, can you go get a bullhorn? She went to go get a bullhorn. And I went over, described, told Andy Card. Um, and he said, where could we speak? Well, between the time of talking to Nina and going to see Andy, I turned around to find a place where the president could speak from. And literally, I was standing right in front of a crushed fire truck and on the top of it were three guys and when I looked up one of them jumped off the back of the truck two guys were there I got their attention one was a younger Latino guy and then an older guy and I said is this safe and they said and I said jump up and down and they sort of looked at me and they said jump up and down so these two guys jumped up and down on this thing and it looked like it was stable enough that we could have the president clamber up to the top of it I noticed there was a piece of uh, paving material that was on top of one of the wheel covers, and I went to move it, and a cop grabbed my arm and said, don't move it, there may be a body part underneath. Yeah. So I went and told Andy, I said, they're going to want to hear from the president. He said, where can we speak? And I said, well, you know, over here on top of this truck. And he said, you're right, let's do it. And he went and got the president. I went back, we got in a bullhorn. At this point, one of the firefighters had gotten off, and all that was left was this older guy, Bob Beckwith. And uh, when the president came over, Beckwith was sort of looking out at the crowd. Next thing you know, some guy's holding up his hands, and Beckwith reaches down his hand, pulls him up, and finds out, figures out it's the president of the United States standing right next to him and freaks out and tries to climb off the truck. And the president, to steady him up, throws He's his arm around him. Yeah. yeah. And a really remarkable moment. Uh, all right. Uh, you even say in the book that Bush's presidency was defined by war. And specifically, I want to get to that. You make a very strong defense of it in, in the book. Uh, you have a lot of personal tragedy.